What's going on, U.S. History Kids? Mr. Tomei here. Uh, we're starting our new unit here, our sixth unit of the uh, year, second unit of the semester, talking about World War II. Um, you probably remember a little bit about World War II from your uh, world history class. Uh, we're going to be primarily looking at the World War from the U.S. perspective, but uh, we're also going to sprinkle in just some kind of, you know, reminder, context information as well. Um, so it'll, it'll be slightly comprehensive with a focus on uh, more of the U.S. involvement and uh, life here in the United States uh, during World War II. Uh, moving through these years pretty fast. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, today, hopefully it won't be too long of a video, but we do got to get through a decent amount of stuff. So the first uh, section of our video, the first video of, of this unit, which will be a little bit longer of a unit, about a month, um, we're going to be talking about Europe and rise of totalitarianism, total, uh, totalitarianism in Europe. And this exists from the, uh, the 20s through the early 30s. So kind of just to give you some background, as a reminder, again, we're coming out of a Great Depression, a worldwide economic collapse around the world. Um, Europe is a mess like the United States. Um, Europe is also has the other layer that most of Europe was destroyed or in ruins from World War I, at least the major cities. Um, and so there was still a lot of rebuilding that was trying to be done and and spirits were already down and millions of people had died. And so, you know, it was tough times in Europe. Um, and so a lot of Europeans became attracted to powerful type of figures and leaders who, who sought to kind of restore and rebuild these different countries around Europe to a former greatness. Um, so again, there were a lot of problems in post-World War I Europe right? They were looking for a change, looking for new leadership. Um, before we kind of get into talking about individual leaders, we kind of got to talk about different terms that are used. And I kind of got to explain it because it's very nuanced. And, and a lot of things seem similar, but oftentimes they're different. Um, so a lot of these definitions are going to sound similar. But again, they're nuanced. So I'm going to try and explain that nuance to you. So we'll start looking at totalitarianism. This is a system of government where the, that, you know, there's a centralized government that is a dictatorial um, and it requires complete subservience to the state if you wanna be a part of that society. Uh, totalitarianism, you could think of as in a lot of ways, a greater umbrella of some of the other terms we'll talk about like Nazism, authoritarianism, fascism. Um, authoritarianism, authoritarianism is very similar to totalitarianism, um, but it's more of the enforcement aspect. It's the policy aspect. It's the belief that you know you have to be strictly obedient to authority, not necessarily always the state, but just the chain of command and the authority, which is often tied to the government, right? Um, but authoritarianism also dictates itself, dictates itself to family life you respect your parents, right? The teacher, you respect the teacher in all, the, you respect your boss, right? Um, so it's not just specifically a government thing. It's also kind of like a, uh, like a way of life. And then fascism. Uh, fascism is the belief that a person's nation is more valuable than an individual person of that nation. So it's kind of like crazy uber nationalism. In a lot of ways, and we're going to show you an example of this, it's kind of like what Trump and the MAGA people are about, that it's the whole America is more important than the people that make up America or the idea of America, the red, white, and blue, the flag is more important than the people that are being oppressed, right? Um, there's a lot of similarities with that. Um, and so fascism was a popular, was a popular, um, uh thinking model after a way to way to uh i'm stumbling on my words um it was a popular kind of way of thinking in government after world war one it's talking about powerful governments powerful leaders um fascism became popular it led to the rise of uh mussolini in italy 
different but similar with Hitler. Hitler's more Nazism, which again is a whole nuanced thing. We're going to get into that as well. Um, so this just kind of shows you the Venn diagram between like communism, fascism, Nazism. There's a lot of different isms that we talk about and I don't want to overwhelm you. Um, um, but Nazism is going to be more specific to, you know, Nazi Germany. Fascism is going to be more specific to Italy and communism is going to be more specific to the Soviet Union. And of course they, sorry, as I'm going quick ahead, they're going to kind of layer over each other in like Venn diagram type ways. Now, this is kind of an important compass to give you kind of perspective. Some of these names, you're going to be like, who the heck? What is this? I don't understand. I don't even know who these people are. But some of these names or these places will sound a little bit more familiar or well known, or you might understand, or you might have heard of them. This is kind of the political compass. It's the most basic political compass that pretty much determines on the x-axis, right? If you lean more to the left on political issues or more to the right. If you lean to the left, you're probably gonna be more in favor of like, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, LGBTQ plus issues, fighting for equality, um, uh, raising minimum wage, things like that. Um, that's gonna be more to the left. Whereas if you're on the right, you're gonna be, you know, less, you're gonna be harder maybe on crime, you're gonna be more pro-war um, and it, you run the gambit of the issues. You might be, you know, against abortion, right? And so on and so forth. The y-axis determines how authoritarian or libertarian you are. Authoritarian being you believe that the government should be, is always right, that the government controls you know, every aspect of, uh, of your life, right? The more authoritarian you are, the more you believe the government should be involved in controlling things and controlling your life. Whereas on the bottom half, right, if you go down the y-axis, the more you kind of believe the government should stay out of affairs and stay out of your business and, you know, you should be free to do what you want. So there's a couple names on here and you're gonna be kind of surprised about where they might stand. So let's look at the big ones. So Obama, even though he's a Democrat, a liberal, uh, he's actually really more right to center than I think you know, people would wanna believe. Someone like Bernie Sanders is truly more to the left. Someone that advocates for universal health care, someone that advocates for free college, the erasing of student debt, that stuff Obama was never about, right? Um, but that's something that Sanders is. Sanders is very over here. That's why a lot of people are so like on the right, so scared of Sanders, because he is very left compared to anything we have in America, right? Biden is probably right around where Obama is, maybe a little bit more to the left, but not by much. Um, you'll also find you know, other names like Trump. Trump is pretty far up right. Right. He's kind of by Ronald Reagan, who's even more up to the right as well. Other names in that area, if you go more to the left and up, who are very authoritarian are like Hitler. Saudi is short for like the Saudi kind of government, um, Saudi Arabia. So these are kind of people you might have heard of before you got Bushes over there. Right. And then if we head kind of below to the right, some names you probably heard before is Jefferson, George, that's President Jefferson, right? Thomas Jefferson, you have President George Washington, and you have other names that you don't really need to worry about. They're, you know, they're, um, you know, different types of people. Um, so these are, uh, these are people who are going to be on the right, but maybe who are less big government. If we head to the left, right, these are people that are um, also for less government, but are more progressive on issues. Some big names include Man, uh, Mandela, Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, um, the idea and concept of Marxism, uh, presidential candidate who was a third party candidate, her name was Jill Stein, who ran in 2016. I think she got like 1% of the vote, which isn't that bad, maybe a little less than that actually. And then Bernie Sanders is kind of right on that line. Um, you also have countries like Luxembourg, it's a real country that is very, very, very left and also pretty libertarian. 
Um, and then we get to the top left corner. Again, some more names and places you're gonna hear of. Pakistan, China. Um, these are, you know, believe in a little bit bigger governments but are more, you know, liberal on a lot of issues. Stalin, very, very top left. So very authoritarian, but also advocates for, you know, more liberal beliefs. So undoubtedly, you all and we all fall somewhere on this compass. Where you fall, uh, you know, you'd have to take the quiz. There's actually an online place you can go to called I Side With that does a pretty good job of uh, kind of pointing you on this compass. So you should take it. It's called I Side With. It's a long quiz, but if you go through it, you'll end up on this compass somewhere. And they'll show you kind of where you are with other people. Whew, okay, let's keep going. So we're going to look at Stalin, we're going to look at Mussolini, we're going to look at Hitler, and then we're going to look at the start of um, how World War II starts. We've got to get through a lot just to bring, provide you context. So rise of Stalin. Russia went through a communist revolution in the early 20s and then became the Soviet Union. You probably all the eighth grade boys when you sing the songs in the bathroom or whatever. Um, Stalin eventually worked his way up the ladder and uh, ultimately became the leader of the Soviet Union in 1929. Um, and communism is a political economic system that is meant to be true equality for everyone. Um, this results in the government being very powerful. Um, communism, if we go back to the scale, um, is going to find you somewhere in this area, the upper kind of left corner. Pa uh, places like Vietnam, that's a communist country. Castro, Fidel Castro, leader of Cuba, a communist country. China, a Cuba uh, communist country. Mao Zedong. Uh, Lenin, these are communist leaders. Lenin was the leader before Stalin. Um, and so that's where you're going to find communism at, is in this upper left corner. Stalin was a pretty, uh, pretty rough dude who was pretty power hungry and wanted to hold on to power at really any cost. Um, you know, he was able to carry a lot of favor because he turned the Soviet Union from kind of like a peasant farm country to a powerful industrial giant with a strong military over the course of just a matter of years. Um, and then, of course, anyone who dared to counter kind of what Stalin was doing or even wanted to debate him on issues felt his wrath. That wrath usually meant being sent to Siberia to work in a gulag. No, not Call of Duty, but like a literal gulag, which is a prison work camp where about 2 million people died and over 18 million people were sent. Um, so Stalin is a, you know, a pretty big uh, abuser of human rights. Um, but this is why he was able to hold power because if you spoke out against him or the government, you would pay the price. Let's go over to Italy. Um, other big player name is Benito Mussolini. He fought in World War I for Italy. Um, and after the war, he became very popular for a lot of his speeches, uh, where he always talked about returning Italy to its former greatness. He would talk about like rebuilding the Roman Empire. And people got really jazzed about that. They're like, oh yeah, here we go, Roman Empire. Italians were really proud about that. He and his black shirt militants went around Italy using violence to attack and to intimidate anyone who stood against fascism and Mussolini. Similar to say like the Proud Boys of the United States. There are many connections you could make to Mussolini and the Proud Boys on um, the black shirts. Eventually Mussolini takes over in 1929, around the same year actually that Stalin takes over too. Um, uh, eventually they march over the capital in Rome. Uh, there is a fear of a civil war. So the King of Italy decides to kind of like appease Mussolini and like create this new position called prime minister. Um, but then eventually the king was stripped of the power that he had and then Mussolini became the de facto leader. Um, so the king kind of played himself. Um, and as a result, Mussolini became the all powerful leader of Italy in 1929. And of course, we get to probably the most infamous, um, Adolf Hitler. Uh, another guy who fought in World War I. He was actually born in Austria. Um, but to give you context of... Uh, um, where that actually might be. I'll go to Google Maps. Google Maps. Austria neighbors Germany. These countries are very close to each other. Uh, if it loads. 
this. Keep going, keep going. You can do it across the United States. And then we get to Europe. Okay, so here's Germany up here. And then here's Austria. And uh, Hitler grew up kind of near the border area between Germany and Austria. Um, and so there's a lot of crossover here between similar language, culture, and customs. Getting back to the PowerPoint slides. Hitler always viewed himself really in like he wanted to be more of a German than Austrian. He even fought as a German in World War I instead of fighting for Austria and Hungary because he just thought Germany was a superior country. Uh, Hitler also was like a pretty good artist. After the war, he tried to do art school and failed. Um, you know, perhaps maybe the world would have been better had his art teacher allowed him to do art. Um, but Hitler was just an angry individual in general. And when Germany lost the war, he blamed the loss on certain ethnic religious groups and different people, the Jews, for example, um, who were quote unquote away from the fighting in the war or, um, you know, were the result of the, the re people to blame for the great depression, right? So, you know, Hitler kind of after the war being a soldier, a lot of soldiers tried to enter politics. Um, and Hitler's way of kind of gaining popularity was like doing hate speech about anyone who is a non-Aryan member of German society. Uh, and an Aryan is someone who is a white Nordic European who is also Christian, that had to be important. So like people from Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, that's kind of like the pure blood um, of Aryan blood. He thought the Aryans were superior. So you could see, I'm not gonna go through all the uh, lists here, but that's just the list of people who Hitler thought was weak or subhuman um, and didn't really belong in German society or were kind of just a waste of space. Uh, that gets worse when we talk about the Holocaust and whatnot. Eventually, um, Hitler rises up to power because he creates the Nazi party. The Nazi party is very, becomes very popular um, and eventually Hitler takes power um, and creates Nazi Germany. Um, and Nazism is the political belief that it, it's rooted in racism and this concept of racial superiority over the, uh, of the Aryan race over all others in Germany. Um, so, you know, as Hitler became powerful, Hitler tried to do different things. He tried to go and like, you know, obviously he was talking really hateful rhetoric. He was taking over countries, you know, he was building up his army again, which was in a rejection of the Treaty of Versailles, going against the Treaty of Versailles because the Treaty of Versailles stripped Germany of all of its power. One of the big things Hitler ran on was like, I'm gonna rebuild Germany and I'm gonna punish the people that forced us you know, to deal with the Treaty of Versailles. And so the German people were like, yay, and excited about that. Even though Hitler was saying, you know, pretty much, hey, it's all, we're gonna go after the Jews and eventually that manifested into worse things. Um, so no one really stood up to him. Uh, people were appeasing to him because Hitler had some political clout. Um, and they also didn't really want to go to war again with Germany, even, you know, it had only been, you know, 15 years or so since the World War I had, uh, um, ended. Um, you know, the British did not stand up to him. The French didn't. The Americans didn't. No one stood up to him. And we all gave in to Hitler's demands. And that's not how you deal with tyrants and people who are doing hateful rhetoric. Uh, eventually, we get this creation of the Axis powers. Um, we'll talk about Japan later, but the Axis powers is uh, you get Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and uh, the Empire of Japan. Um, the Soviet Union is absent from this because the Soviet Union and Nazism are kind of against each other. Again, if we go all the way, ah, I'm going too far, I'm, I'm foreshadowing, we're almost done. If we go way back to the scale, Hitler is over here on the right, Stalin is on the left. Communism would be over here on the left, Nazism is gonna be over here on the right, okay? So even though we talk about Mussolini, or sorry, we talk about Stalin, uh, he's not gonna be involved. The Soviet Union is not gonna be involved in this group. They're going to inevitably be on the other side. They're actually gonna be teaming up with the United States 
um, for a little bit uh, in World War II. Um, but we'll get into that. Uh, and so these Axis powers agreed to kind of take over the world, split up the world. Uh, and primarily their main focus originally was to fight the Soviet communists of Soviet communism, not interfere with each other, but you know, each country really had greater plans. Um, and then eventually, we're almost at the end here. Um, uh, Germany invades Poland. Um, they use the Blitzkrieg, which is like a very lightning fast attack. Uh, that's why in football it's called the Blitz. Um, so in response to the invasion of Poland, the rest of Europe really now had to face the truth that Hitler wanted to conquer all of Europe and they finally needed to stop him, even though it had been clear for years that this is what Hitler wanted to do, but they were kind of weak and were just trying to appease him. And so finally, September 3rd, 1939, France and Britain declare war on Germany. And then eventually we'll get into it, but sides are taken. Um, and then as time goes on, we'll talk about how the United States gets involved. Um, and we'll talk about Japan in our next video, but I don't wanna to go too long because this video has been pretty long. Okay, a lot of content we had to cover, um, but uh, make sure you watch this video and do the homework assignment. Um, and I will talk to you guys uh, later. Have a good one.